any type of change across the district. Rightfully so, because conversations of this magnitude, when we are considering the closure or historic changes of a school, should never be taken lightly. And believe me, this task force has not taken it lightly either in their conversations leading up to this point. As you are sharing your thoughts tonight, I would ask four things of you. First, we are not here to debate past decisions that were made by, by past administrations because there is no way to turn back the clock. Second, we want to embrace our history and the legacies of our schools. But history and legacy cannot prevent us from considering changes that we have to make. There are some realities that we have to face in this process when buildings are underutilized and students are being deprived of opportunities to receive a quality education. Third, please do not discount our students, their grit, and their ability to adapt to change. We have learned this in our years of having to go through this process, unfortunately, several other times over the last 15 to 20 years. As I said, fourth, please keep an open mind this evening as you review the information and as you hear others uh, talk about the different options that are on the table. As I said before, changes in Columbus City Schools are always made stronger when the community's voices are a part of the process. So I, the Board of Education, and I just saw Mr. Cole walk in with his uh, daughter. Mr. Cole, please stand up and be recognized. Know that the Board of Education, myself, and our staff look forward to hearing from you tonight and even after tonight as we consider these options that have been presented by the task force. Thank you for listening. Now I would like to ask Scott Barner, a member of our team, to facilitate the next segment of tonight's process. Mr. Barner. Well, good evening. My name is Scott Warner. I am the Executive Director for Communications for the District, and it's been my honor to work with the task force members over these past several months as we've looked at different recommendations, different data sets. As the communications person, they wanted somebody that could boil all of this work down into something that's about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, so we can quickly go through all of this information and get to the part that you're really here for, that's to provide your feedback. Before we get started, though, I'm going to say that this presentation that we have up here is all going to be on our app. So if for whatever reason you can't see the screen up here and you want to make sure that you have a copy of tonight's presentation, just download the Columbus City Schools mobile app, which I'm sure everybody here already has. Uh, but just go to the app. The first button on it you'll see is about the facilities task force. Go to that page and we've got this presentation so you can follow along. So again, if you want to use the app to follow along, you can. But let's start tonight kind of remembering what this task force is all about. You've heard kind of some talk about what the task force and their responsibility is. But this group of community individuals was put together um, to be supported by district staff, district staff that would be able to provide to them um, expertise, give them some of the history behind decisions of the past, look at national best practices, so that this task force could review data and make recommendations on changes to either our schools or administrative sites. Those changes may be closure, but more so that, that task force wanted to look at those uh, changes that could be more about attendance boundaries, might be about grade configuration, might be about feeder patterns, and how we're utilizing those to best fill um, and maximize the use of our schools. That task force could not just make decisions on a whim, they had to be based on a good rationale and based upon board policy, that is a list of criteria that the board has set forth um, as we look at schools. And the plan is to have a final report by October. So this is kind of what the calendar looks like. You can see starting way back in April, it was when this task force began its process. We get all the way down to 
tonight here in September. Why this calendar is important, we want to make sure that you saw this is not a rush decision. It's something that this task force has looked at for uh, a number of months. At the same time, we want to make sure that this process is wrapped up in time so that by January, when our students and families are able to enter into the school lottery program to choose where they want to go, they know what's going to be in, what's going to be coming. We don't want students to be entering that lottery and not have a sense what might happen to my building. So that's kind of the calendar so that you can understand that this has been a long, thorough process. So let's talk about the process so you understand how we got to where we got to today. So in thinking about changes to our schools, how we best maximize the use of our buildings, it always begins with our benefit to students. You heard Dr. Stanford stress that a number of times. What are we doing to make sure that we are putting as a priority our best benefits to students? At the same time, what are we doing to make sure that we are using our buildings most efficiently and effectively as possible? From there then, the task force kind of broke it down into three phases, if you will. First off, we needed to look at the quantitative data, the numbers. We wanted to see what each building had in terms of students and the use of the building. Then we wanted to make more of a qualitative look at the building. What are some of those factors that for those who work in the building, for those who work with the students, work with the communities that are affected by each of those buildings. What qualities are there about each building? And then finally, we want to look at the impact, because if there is any change that's going to happen to a building, we know that it will have an impact, an impact on other schools, an impact on the students, an impact on the community. So it's these three criteria that we looked at with every building across the district. So in that first phase, when we talked about the data, looking at the numbers, some of the things that we looked at were student enrollment. How many students actually are enrolled and in that building? At the same time, you look at the building's utilization. How full is the building? Are we using all of it, all 100%? Are we only using 50% of the building? What's the building's condition? How old is the building? Has it been renovated? Has it been replaced? Is it one of our buildings that's receiving some upgrades and some retrofitting thanks to that bond package approved two years ago in Operation Fix It? And finally, the student transfer in and transfer out rates. How many students live in that neighborhood and actually attend their neighborhood school? How many students are actually coming in from other parts of the city to attend that school? And how many are living in that neighborhood but choosing not to go to the school in their neighborhood? So those were some of the numbers that we started looking at. From there, then we began to look at some of those qualitative issues, some of the quality factors of the building. Everything from the type of educational program that's being offered. If, like this building, it's a STEM school, we want to make sure that that STEM program is being um, implemented with fidelity. We want to look at the access. How easy and safe is it for students to get to and from the school? Is it accessible? Is it ADA compliant? What's the future use of that building or the land that's there? What are some of the circumstances in that building? What are some maybe, maybe some of the neighborhood groups that are um, a part of that building and use that building? What are maybe some unique location or site characteristics? Then we even took some different approaches using uh, with some data from our friends at Morpsey, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. We were actually able to look at residential trends in that neighborhood. Are there going to be more people expected to live there? More importantly, are there going to be more people with students, with young people in their households? What's the lottery look like, the wait list, when we do go into um, talking about school choice? What's the grade band design? You're going to hear me touch upon this one a, a few times throughout tonight. As part of that facilities master plan process that Dr. Stanford talked about, we listened to the community who said, you know, as we look across the district, we want to see more of a, a return to some of the traditional grade banding. That's where you have an elementary school that's kindergarten through fifth grade, and we're possible pre-K. A middle school experience, that's grades 6 through 8. And then a true high school experience is grades 9 through 12. Our community overwhelmingly said they support going back to that more traditional grade banding. So that was one of the qualitative factors we looked at. We looked at the ability to host events, some of the limitations or options that we as a district put on the building, and finally, how about work orders? Just the number of times that our district staff has to come out to repair a building uh, or part of it. So these are some of the qualitative issues. And then finally, the impact. So if you're going to make a change to a building, we want to make sure that we address these issues. If you're going to close or change uh, the configuration of a building, what would happen to the relocation? Would there be places for 
if you close the school to put those students? What kind of burden might it create, not only on the school that they're going to, but also to the community? What impacts might it have to diversity? The ability to accommodate that school choice program or maintain our feeder patterns, and more importantly about academic work. We want to make sure that students um, are placed in schools where their academics can continue to improve. So that's a lot of work, but that's also about four or five months of information that, that that task force really looked through and considered as we get to tonight some of those recommendations that were put together. It's looking at all of these elements and then trying to put the best uh, proposals forward. So let me walk you through the school recommendations. There's five of them. So I'm going to try to walk through each of them. I'll probably go through it a couple times each just to make sure that you have the best clarity. I want to make sure that when you go to the breakout sessions, that when you sit down, we're all kind of from the same page. We all understand what the recommendation is, whether you agree with it or not. Just want to make sure that everyone has that clarity on what the re recommendation is. So let's start with the first one. This is one that involves Highland Elementary, West Broad, and Westgate Elementary. The proposal here is that for these three elementary schools, we want to adjust the attendance boundaries so that we best maximize the use of all three buildings, um, especially one that has received some ma major renovations. Now actually when we looked at this, the four, there's actually four schools here on the west side that we looked at, so we include those three, plus we look at Valley View, um, but it's really only Highland that's received some of those major improvements. We know we can't close any of those buildings to combine them, just that there's not enough room um, and that might create some um, difficulties for us in the future. But we do know that by changing the attendance boundaries, we can better balance the enrollment in each of those buildings, because it's a little crowded at West Broad, so take, alleviate some of the crowding at West Broad, put them across more buildings, and then also create some safety improvements. If I go to the map, I think you'll better see this, and I know it's bright, but this line right here, that's West Broad Street. That's one of our city's busiest streets. Currently, if you live on the other side of West Broad, you still go to West Broad Elementary, forcing you to cross what is a very busy, inter uh, busy lane. <laughs> At the same time, this kind of line that goes right here, that's Hague Avenue, which can also be very busy at times. So what this proposal does is it says students who currently live in this area that used to attend West Broad starting next year, you would attend Highland Elementary. You wouldn't have to cross West Broad Street, you wouldn't have to cross Hay. If you live in this little section, instead of going to West Broad, you'll go down to Westgate Elementary. Again, no longer do you have to cross a busy road, and instead, uh, and don't have to cross Hay, and you go to a building that better allows us to even out the attendance in all three schools. That one's pretty easy to understand. So real quick, just by a show of hands, how many of you are here because that impacts uh, your student, or you're interested more about West Broad or Highland. Anybody here for the West Side? A couple of people? Perfect. We're just trying to get a better sense, because then when we break out, I'll let you know where, which rooms you want to go to so that you can make sure to get more of your questions answered and get your feedback. So that's recommendation number one. Let me move to recommendation number two. This one involves North Linden Elementary and Mays Elementary. So here you have Mays Elementary, which is under capacity. There's extra room there. And you have North Linden Elementary, which is over capacity. It's pretty crowded there. So again, by readjusting the attendance boundaries, we start to even out the enrollment. At the same time, there's a, um, a special unit that works there um, for our English as a second language for many of our new American families and those young people that are still learning English as a language. There's currently one unit at, um, a strong unit at North Linden. We actually would probably have to add another one at Mays, which again would better serve young people in that, and families in that area. Let me show you the map, because this is always so much easier to understand on the map. We're talking about these group, this group of families that currently live in this area. It's actually both of these zones, but this is where the old Northland Mall used to be, so there's just businesses there. Not too many families uh, live at, at Menards, um, which is kind of there. 
So what it would do is it would take both of these areas, and instead of being purple, you'd be green, and you would go to Mays Elementary. So that's just a basic change in the attendance boundary. So again, just by a quick show of hands, how many folks are here to talk about uh, Mays or North Linden? Well, that will be a very quick discussion then for that, that team. Thank you. Let's move on, because each of these gets a little more complicated. Now we're going to look to the third one, and this involves Columbus North International, our Columbus Global Academy, which is currently at Brookhaven, Dominion Middle School, and then Columbus Spanish Immersion, E. Cole Kenwood French Immersion, and Hubbard Mastery School. So what's this proposal? Well, the first part of this proposal takes the students that are currently in our Columbus North International program at the Old North High School, moves all of those students out um, from grades 9 through 12, and sends them down to Brookhaven to co-locate with that Columbus Global Academy. So we create, in that former high school site at Brookhaven, we would now have the Columbus International uh, High School. It would coexist with the Columbus Global Academy, which is something that actually during that facilities master plan process, our community again was very supportive of. Those are two great programs that really do fit well together. For those of you that don't know, our Columbus Global Academy are for those, again, those families that come in, uh, many of our new American families that come in still learning English as a language. So they actually work, they are, they are positioned there um, until they can build up their English language skills at the same time, still taking science, math, English classes. Um, and then when they are ready, then they return to their home school. We would actually set it up so their new home school could be this new uh, Columbus International High School. So with that move then, that leaves this high school building on the north side of town open, the old North High School. So our proposal would be then to take Dominion Middle School, which is currently a very crowded building, and move them into this bigger open site. So move them from a crowded middle school site into this high school building, which has a lot more features of a high school, uh, a larger theater space, science labs, um, that would allow them to no longer be as crowded. At the same time, though, this gives us an opportunity to rethink the programming at Dominion, work with our families to actually expand Dominion's program and add a language immersion component or a special language component like we haven't seen anywhere else in a middle school. What that does is it solves a couple of, of issues. Um, I'm going to advance so we can start to see some of it. Um, Part of why we do that, so again, is to make sure that we're fully utilizing Brookhaven. Those are two programs that coexist together. But one of the reasons we want to create that language component is right now in Columbus Spanish Immersion and E. Cole Kenwood and at Hubbard, we see a dramatic decrease. Those are schools that have sixth grade in them. They're elementary buildings that have sixth grade in them. And we often see a drop in enrollment after fifth grade because those young people don't know where their middle school is going to be. You don't want to stay in sixth grade for one year and not sure where your middle school is going to be. So they miss out on continuing that great language immersion program. This would give them a dedicated place by which to do that. They would have a dedicated space by which to continue that Spanish, French immersion program at Hubbard Mastery. There's work in Mandarin, so we'd be able to actually work on that and give them an opportunity to continue that in Dominion. That would fill that North High School building. Not only would you have Dominion, but you'd have this great language uh, programming and really expand the opportunities at Dominion. Now, this is not something easy to do when you reimagine the academic offerings at a school. So what's unique about this proposal? While everything else I talk about tonight is for next school year, this one and another one are actually proposed. It's a two-year implementation process. So it wouldn't be for next year. It would be for the following year. As I mentioned before, one of the things that you're going to hear me repeat a lot tonight is that great van configuration. One of the reasons that you would want to see uh, and that the task force really promoted these recommendations is about providing students with true high school experiences and true middle school experiences. By having an opportunity for that 6th, 7th, and 8th grades to be together in one building, um, to know where your next steps are going to be is important. So you're going to see that repeated a lot, that true middle school experience. Let me just show you the maps here real quick because I think this is very helpful. What you see, this big purple section, is the current 
neighborhood attendance zone. So anyone who lives in the purple, their neighborhood school is Dominion. We would be moving them to this red dot, which is International High School, uh, that North High School building. So you see it's still in the neighborhood and actually is very close to the geographic center uh, where everyone lives. So that's that proposal that involves North High School and Dominion. Show of hands real quick, how many folks are here for that proposal? Great, thank you. We'll make sure you get to the, to the right room. Let's move on to our south side. So the next two involve uh, a, a lot bigger ideas here. And so I'm gonna probably walk through it a couple times because it, I think it can be kind of confusing at first. But this is the south side. So these are the feeder patterns that currently feed into South High School and Marion Franklin High School. And it's a readjustment of all of them um, and the closure of an elementary. Let me explain how this one works. So what we would do with Marion Franklin High School, a building that is currently underutilized, that means we don't fill it up enough, is we would change Marion Franklin Middle School into, uh, or excuse me, change the high school into a middle school. Change the high school into a middle school. So the current high school students who are at Marion Franklin would now go to South High School. At South High School, we would change that to back to a traditional high school. So just grades nine through 12. So it would have, so South would now have both Marion Franklin in it and, and the current South High School students. By creating this new middle school at Marion Franklin, that allows us to actually close Buckeye Middle School. So students who would have attended Buckeye Middle School now attend this new Marion Franklin Middle School. What I don't know if many of you know, but then on the south side, very similar to the Linda McKinley feeder pattern, is that the elementaries that feed into the school are currently these K-6s, again, where sixth grade students are still in elementary. And so the proposal would be in all of those buildings to move that sixth grade out and put them in this new Marion Franklin Middle School. You see how we're starting to really feed more students, young people, into that middle school um, and use that building. By doing that, that actually creates enough space where Siebert Elementary, which is one of our district's older buildings, um, we would actually be able to close that. We would be able to send those students to Stewart Elementary, which is a newer building, and to Southwood Elementary, again, another newer building. So moving students from an older building uh, into newer buildings, buildings with air conditioning, by the way. At the same time, Cedarwood, Parsons, and Watkins, who used to feed into Buckeye, would now, their feeder pattern would be to this Marion Franklin Middle School. So why are we doing this? Why did the task force um, accept this proposal? Because again, what you heard is that we start to better use the building at Marion Franklin. As a middle school, we're able to put more young people into it by Taking those six grades out, that gives those other buildings, the elementaries, um, more space to actually address some of the maybe other issues or challenges, opportunities that um, allow for student success. It also um, creates the opportunity where funding is possible to add pre-K, and that's one of our district and our city's big parties is adding pre-K. So by taking that sixth grade out, we may actually open up space for pre-K. It really is about utilization. So Marion Franklin, the current utilization rate is only 53%. So we need to find a better way to utilize that building. Um, by restoring that traditional feeder pattern, that's something that the facilities task force, uh, excuse me, both the facilities task force and that um, facilities master planning group really wanted to see the community. The larger enrollments at each grade level. So this is something you heard Dr. Stanford mention that by having larger enrollments, so by putting a South High School that is truly filled, by having a middle school that is truly filled, we're actually able to offer more academic program, more variety, when there's currently only, when there's a small number, and of that small number, only maybe two or three students are interested in a topic, that, takes, that makes it tough for that school to invest in a special teacher to teach for a topic that only two or three students are interested in. But when you grow that number, when you double the number of students in a the building, then there are more students, more opportunities to add diverse programming. 
And so that's why you want to see some of those larger schools that allow us for, to offer more academic programming. Uh, Marion Franklin is also a building that's received some significant operation fix-it dollars. It's a building that will soon have air conditioning, unlike Buckeye Middle School. As I mentioned before, by shifting those grades out of um, the elementary schools actually allows us to um, change Siebert so that we can absorb those students into two other nearby neighboring schools, allowing those students who attend Siebert to instead go to a building that is one of our newer buildings. Let me get to the map because I think this is very helpful. You start to see that this feeder pattern now ends at South High School, which is then fed by this new Marion Franklin Middle School. These are the six plus three, so that's nine elementary schools now feeding into this building. The other opportunity in this plan is that, um, again, there's a lot of pride and history behind East, uh, South High School and Marion Franklin. By maintaining those buildings, we maintain that sense of pride that comes with those buildings. This is a closer, this is a kind of a close-up of this map that kind of shows you what the new attendance zone would be for the new South High School feeder pattern. This is just kind of a closer look at the students that are currently in um, the attend Siebert. Again, that's an area where there really aren't a lot of students that live in that neighborhood and attend that school. A lot of students transfer in. Um, this shows you the same that they would move to Stewart, and then we'd also use Southwood Elementary to take care of those students. So that one's a little more complicated, but again, show of hands, how many of you are here for the south side, some of the schools on the south side? Great, thank you. So I'm guessing most of you are probably here for this next recommendation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So again, let me walk through this recommendation, uh, because very similar to the next one, it has some of the same challenges and potentially some of the same opportunities. So what is it that the task force is recommending? So the task force is recommending, similar to what we just talked about with Marion Franklin, is converting Linda McKinley into a middle school, into a middle school. So you would take the current ninth through 12th grades out of this building and send those to East High School. Give me just a minute, I'll walk through it. And that's the whole point tonight, so we can hear your thoughts. So, so let's run through it here. Let's run through it. So currently, so as you know, this building is currently 7 through 12. So 7th and 8th grades would stay. So that would be part of the Linda McKinley Middle School. In all of those elementary schools that are currently K-6, you would take the 6th grade out, and again, feed those into this new, build, into this new uh, middle school. At the same time, there are ESL units, those English as a special uh, second language components, both at Medina and Mifflin. We kind of talked about those at another school. We would actually also take those out of those two middle schools and move them here to Linda McKinley because that would provide them newer space, um, better space, provide those services to the community and still be within the community. When we do that, we can actually combine Medina and Mifflin in one building and we would actually close Mifflin Middle School. Let me walk through this again so you better understand it. And again, this is one of these tricky ones that we put this special note. This is something that would take us two years to implement. So not for next year, but for the following year. So again, you convert this building into a middle school, take the middle school grades, keep them here, take the high school grades and move them to east. That allows us to expand east high school's feeder pattern so that now you have a lot of buildings feeding into east. Um, you have sixth graders that then come out of these elementary buildings, actually get a true middle school experience. And then it actually gives us an ability to better serve our English as a second language young people who are currently being served at Mifflin and Medina, and actually close Mifflin Middle School, which is an older building, doesn't have air conditioning, has a lot of physical challenges. So why? Why, are we, why did the task force think about this? So a couple things to think about, again, we're talking about the use of the building. So you currently look at, East currently is at 51%. East High School, the utilization is just 51%. That's because you're gentrifying the so, east side and the near east side. I appreciate, I appreciate it. The, the 
community over there. That's why the, the, the enrollment is so low in East. There's not enough people who have kids that live there. So that's right after this. So as soon as we go no, through no, these no, proposals, no, you can talk together. We came to talk together, not to get broken out into groups. You'll all be in the same room and opportunity to share it. So we want to make sure that we hear from everybody. You clown. You clown. So again, to go through this, we move all of those. So let me why show you. you We appreciate it, and we're going to hear all of this information in the breakout sessions. So again, a couple of things to think about. By moving by moving those elements over, that allows us to have that dedicated STEM focus in the middle school, a true middle school experience. Again, it allows us to continue the pride in the history of this building as well as in East. And as you know, East is currently part of the Ohio State University, the Health Sciences Academy. That's why it's going to take us a little extra time to get both of those programs together so that you can have STEM and health sciences together. So here, let's look at this feeder pattern again so you better understand how the feeder pattern works. You know, have two middle schools that would feed into East High School, allowing us to better utilize East High School. All of the same elementary still feed into Lynn McKinley, but now as just a middle school. And then you have your traditional uh, schools that still feed into Champion. Allows us, again, to provide that better program because you have filled buildings. We just go through the map again. You can start to see kind of what that attendance boundary would look like. You would see how schools would then feed into the Linda McKinley STEM. And then you kind of see that split between Medina and Mifflin. And by moving the components out of that and into this great building, that allows us to combine both of those and close Mifflin. You can't do nothing with me. No, sir. No, sir. So I won't even ask for show of hands because I'm pretty sure most of you here are to talk about this. So I appreciate it. That's perfect. So in just a minute, we're going to break up and allow you to actually, and we have one room which is completely dedicated to this, to the conversation about, conversations about this. Now, before we wrap up though, let me just quickly run through. This task force did not just stop by looking at school buildings. They did quickly look at some of our administrative sites. Same kind of things, they looked at some of the use of our administrative buildings, what the impacts would be, kind of what the future use, and how those buildings are being used. There are, um, these are the 10 buildings that they made recommendations on. Very quickly, there are three buildings that they think that in the next year we should be able to close, you move those services to other parts of the district. That would be our bus compound that's currently up on Morris Road, the former Beering Middle School that's currently the Marion Franklin Opportunity Center, and our Adult Education Center at Lexington. The proposal is to move, to close those, move those operations somewhere else currently within the district. And this kind of goes through some of the reasons why part of it is that we know that the elements of that bus compound up off Morse Road could be moved elsewhere. For our Opportunity Center, that's currently, again, one of our underutilized buildings. There's currently only one CCS staff person at that building. Uh, we would be able to work with the other tenants of that building as to where they might relocate. And adult education, that's in a former elementary school. Adult classes should be taught somewhere other than a former elementary school. Three other buildings, Linmore Education Center, our 17th Avenue facility, and our Hudson Distribution Center. The task force says that we should look at relocating those operations, but it's probably going to take a different building to do that. It's not something we currently have. That might include the Southland facility or school sites. And by the Southland facility, I'm referring to the former ECOT Center that is on 3700 South High Street on the south side of town. I, I appreciate we're gonna we're gonna get your feedback we want that's what we want to make sure that we hear your your concerns so we can share those with the task force because they want to hear this too I'm not trying to be rude I just no. I can't you're taking everything out of our community we appreciate it and that's what we want to hear from you tonight tonight's about hearing more from you 
So again, I'm not going to go through too, too much of these spaces other than to let you know that those are each individual locations that the district will be able to look at and find other opportunities. And then finally, the task force said for these four buildings within the district, our downtown um, education center, the food production center, the bus compound that's over at Fort Hayes, and for our data center over at Kingswood, those are things that are going to take much more time and study to be able to get through. In part because each of these have very unique roles. There's not too many places that you can box up or create 35,000 lunches each day. So you need special facilities for that. The Fort Hayes compound, that's a lot of buses. And though there's a future use for that site, that's going to take a little more time to figure out where you'd put those buses. And finally, our Kingswood Data Center. Again, that houses all of our important data and information, all of our internet connections. So you can't just simply shut that down one day and move it somewhere else. Is there anybody here that's interested in administrative sites? No. Okay. I am. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you. Because you're taking them out of our community. Which means, what is there so now happen? this is the time that you've been waiting for. This is the time where we get an opportunity to hear from you. A couple of points I want to make sure that you understand. Dr. Stanford mentioned it. You're going to have an opportunity to go into these breakout sessions. We do that so that every voice has an opportunity to be heard. But we know that sometimes in a crowd, you may forget something. There may be something more you want to add. There may be more information you want. So in addition to tonight's meetings, there are three others. But we've also put all of this information on our website, on our app. So in addition to getting tonight's presentation, there's a survey there that you can do if you have the app. You can call our customer relations office. The number there, 365-8888. You can talk to somebody there and share your thoughts. You can email us. It's talk to us at columbus.k12.oh.us. And for those who like to actually write a letter, there's our mailing address. Yep. And actually all of this information, there's a handout at the front door that has all of it on there too. So, as we go into these breakout conversations, when you go into either the cafeteria, the main gym, or the middle school gym, you're going to see breakout tables. At each breakout table is going to be an individual staff person who's there to make sure that we are listening to your comments, that we are taking down and recording the information that you want to share. That person is not there to convince you to change your mind, to make sure that you, know, you walk out of here with a 100% behind something. They are there to listen, to facilitate a conversation so that every voice gets heard, but that more importantly, we take down all that information so that we can share it with the task force. So these are the questions that you're going to be asked. One is, do you understand the proposal? Are there elements that I went through maybe too quickly that you need some more information on to understand how it would work? Again, whether you're in favor of it or not, just want to make sure that you best understand what we talked about tonight. Number two, what additional information do you think the task force should consider? Many of you have already brought up some points that you think that they need to think about. And finally, are there other ideas or recommendations that you would propose, ideas that would still allow us to address the challenges and opportunities that we brought up here tonight, including underutilization um, and making sure that our students have the best academic opportunities? And again, as I mentioned, your feedback is going to be shared. Here's the website address, of, uh, although I know everyone knows it. Dr. Stanford, if you're ready at this time. So, let me just remind everybody where you're going. So, the conversation, the conversation about Linden, which I think most of you will be, will be in the big gym. That's why we put it in the big gym. It's because we want to make sure that uh, everyone had an opportunity to chat. Over in the smaller middle school gym is where we'll have the conversation about Dominion. Um, we'll also have, if anyone wants, about the administrative sites or about the boundary changes, those first two. And then if you want to talk about Marion Franklin and the South Side, that's over in the cafeteria, um, along with if you have specific questions about any of the South Side schools.